Hey everyone, it's Anthony. So I just wanted to take a moment real quick before we start the episode to tell you about something that's pretty cool. Podchaser, which is basically the IMDb of podcasts, is doing their annual Reviews for Good campaign. So throughout the month of April, every review left on a podcast will donate 25 cents to the World Central Kitchen, which is providing meals to refugees fleeing Ukraine. And if the podcast responds, they will double that donation. All you have to do is go to podchaser.com, sign up for free, and leave a review on your favorite podcasts. Our Podchaser link will be in the show notes, and we'll be sure to respond to maximize that donation. So while you're there, don't forget to follow us and check out some of our other podcasting friends. And if you're so inclined, leave them a review too. And as always, if you send us a screenshot of your review along with your address, we will send you a sticker to thank you for your awesome support. So go ahead, head to podchaser.com right now, sign up, and leave us a review. It's going to help some folks that are desperately in need. And now on to your regularly scheduled disclaimer. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch, where comments get counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 151. And as promised previously, this is our first ever sequel episode that we had planned to coincide with the premiere of the Moon Knight TV show. But we are going to be revisiting the character of Moon Knight and not just because he happens to be my favorite character. <laughs> it's Sure, be- keep telling yourself that. It's because the first episode that we did on him, which was episode number four, way, way, way back four years ago, a lot has changed for Mark in that four-year time span in-universe. And also in those four years, we've gotten better at this? Different. Yes, we are. We are different, I would say. More mature-ish. Older. (laughs) Yes. Yes, we are older. Before we get started, awesome, fantastic, very exciting news. We have a brand new patron. Uh, So thank you to Nicole, who has become one of our local officials. So uh, thank you to Nicole. I've already sent you a message and hopefully you get back to me soon with your address so I can send you stickers as a way to say thank you. If you want to be awesome like Nicole and get a shout out on this show, you can head over to patreon.com slash capes on the couch and subscribe at the one, three, four, five dollar level and uh, unlock early access, additional content, uncensored material, all kinds of good stuff. So thank you to Nicole. You are uh, the latest in a long line of awesome kick ass people. Uh, so thank you for your support. And also just again, thank you to everybody who has uh, commented on last week's 150th episode. Uh, I got a lot of fantastic feedback from folks who really thoroughly enjoyed the skit, enjoyed the fun that we had with everything. Uh, I'm glad you all enjoyed it because I spent, I don't know how many hours, literal hours editing that thing, trying to piece together the audio and the sound effects and everything else. Uh, I I really wanted it to be something special. And to make up for that, this episode is a rehash of something we've already done because I've exhausted myself (laughs) with the last episode. So I'm like, I don't have time to do anything. I don't have time to do anything new this week. I'm too tired. That's okay. We'll make it excellent anyway. So normally we go through the background. I would say... You can go back to episode four for the full rundown of Moon Knight's background, but we will give you the sort of recap of all the things that have happened to Moon Knight in the four years since the previous episode with a little bit of overlap. So Moon Knight created by Doug mentioned Don Perlin and Werewolf by Night number 32, August 1975. Go back to episode four for the full rundown. So at the end of the Jeff Lemire run, which I did reference, he had quote unquote, killed Khonshu inside his head and reconciled all of his identities and basically came to terms with the fact that whether it was through his own traumatic history or Khonshu's influence, his DID was 
a part of who he is. And he had come to terms and accepted all of his altars and was going to find a way to at least bring them all together under one roof. And then Yay. the Max Bemis run came along and threw all of that out the window. Ooh. So he discovered he had an unknown daughter fathered by Jake Lockley with Marlene, who opted not to tell Mark or Stephen of this. Said daughter was then kidnapped by Bushman and the Sun King to lure Moon Knight out to kill him. And Moon Knight defeats the Sun King with Khonshu's help and the power of crazy. I'm not making that up. That's a line from the run. The less said about it, the better. So then in Age of Khonshu, which is an event happening in Jason Aaron's Avengers run, under the influence of Khonshu, Moon Knight battles the Avengers to take over the world in order to protect it. And at one point, he became a host for the Phoenix Force. He gave up the power, however, in order to help the Avengers overthrow Khonshu and imprison him. And this is also where we discover that Uru, the rock used to make Mjolnir, is actually, long story short, it's Moon Rock and therefore Moon Knight can control it. So it's full, but I'm not going to get into that. So if we're talking about moons of other planets, I understand the shortcut, but then wouldn't that make him Moon's Knight? Yeah, exactly. So in the current run by Jed McKay, which is fantastic, even though he's no longer under the influence of Khonshu, he decides to resume protecting Travelers of the Night, which was Conf Khonshu's original mission for him. He has discovered he is not the only fist of Khonshu, and after some initial confrontations, he came to an uneasy alliance with the Hunter's Moon, who considers Mark to have gone rogue and hopes to still bring him back under the formal fold of Khonshu worshippers. And he's sort of created this small group of allies that help him. Uh, Tigra is back, his one-time lover. She's pretty much there spying on Mark on behalf of Black Panther, who wants to keep an eye on him after everything went down under Age of Khonshu. So issue nine just came out not that long ago, uh, or issue 10, I forget. But, uh, you know, we're, we're a good ways into the run. Uh, it's fantastic. He's also involved in the Devil's Reign storyline. He was arrested by Wilson Fisk and the NYPD as part of the crackdown on superheroes and masked vigilante, so to speak. And uh, so they all broke out. And uh, I, I picked them up. I haven't actually had an opportunity to finish reading Devil's Reign, full disclosure. So since, again, we covered... I think five issues for Mark in the original episode. We're really just going to talk about two of them here, which is still above average for a particular, for any given character. So the first one is in the current run, he is still coping with the influence from Khonshu, even though he no longer has any actual allegiance to Khonshu. Khonshu has no control over him, is imprisoned in Asgard, yet Moon Knight still wears the suit, dresses in white, protects the travelers of the night, which was his original mission as bestowed upon him by Khonshu. And so the question I would have is, you don't owe him anything at this point. He's gone from your life, theoretically. Why are you continuing to go about doing in some roundabout way his bidding when you don't have to anymore? I'm pretty sure B.F. Skinner would have a field day with this because that's classical conditioning. It's the idea that you have learned behaviors over a certain period of time that you will continue to do regardless of what the external stimuli are, if you want to break it down that basically. And that concludes that topic. Next one. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, there's, there's obviously a, an emotional component to that. Uh, when you have someone that you've either considered to be a mentor or they literally have taken care of you in the biological sense, or you have someone that you've idolized, someone that you, you know is vital to your success or anything that you've done up to that point, let's not even go with the idea that it's been a negative because the, the way it's conveyed with Kanchu, the point is, yeah, he's in, he's basically in, God jail. <laughs> but what if it's that the person passed away? What if it's a person moves and is no longer physically there and they used to be someone that you would see every day? And it doesn't have to be this 
massive power difference. But the point is, the relationship has changed to one that it's not going to be prevalent in your life. Let's flip that on its head, though. Does that mean that, pardon the colloquialism, do you throw the baby out with the bathwater? Does that mean that you ignore everything that you've learned in your lifetime from that particular person? Does that mean that you remove the memories for what you've experienced with that person? And the obvious answers to that are no, especially if those things have been positive. Now, there becomes a much more mature discussion of how do you parse out the things that, let's say, to once again flip, there was something that was negative that happened that ended the relationship. Well, then what do you do with that? Once again, that doesn't mean you negate everything. You can learn the lesson without becoming everything that the teacher was. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's no, nothing hidden behind that. It doesn't have to have some nefarious ulterior motive. But there can be a stigma related to it because let's, let's put this in the potential negative light. And actually the run that you just mentioned, not that this is their intention, but even the way you mentioned bringing him back under the fold of Khonshu worshipers, you know, with, with Hunter's Moon. What if we're talking a cult? What if we're talking just a, a, a very strict system that you're breaking away from? You enjoy the teachings and you, you have a better quality of life because of many of the things that you've learned, but you don't need that restriction anymore. It doesn't suit you for what you're looking to do now. So what happens, and, and this could be any religion, this can be just about any organized activity that you've done that, that you're just looking to adapt. You like the comfort of what's being done, but you know that staying there will just lead to it becoming more and more uncomfortable over time. So do you rip the band-aid off or do you slowly peel it? So in the case of Moon Knight, I'm not making judgments one way or another. In theory, he could have just been Mark Spector, no longer under the influence of Kanshu, who now does the things that he does without any particular branding or all that. And yet, somehow, it's pretty clear when you walk around and someone says, pardon my language, oh, shit, it's Moon Knight. That still carries some gravitas to it. <laughs> so I, I think it's reasonable. And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way to handle that, but either way, there's going to be consequences from a legacy perspective, from a fulfillment perspective, and from a reactionary perspective from anybody else that you're going to talk to, as has been shown with this run. Not everybody's going to agree with it. Uh, some people may actually protest whatever choices you've made. And... There are other people that are going to be like, thank God, finally, you made that decision. You should have made it a long time ago. So whatever the spectrum is of, of what you do, it's probably going to play out in all those ways, often concurrently and often without much that you can do other than continue with the decision that you made. Because the one thing I've noticed with people is there's nothing wrong with with changing your mind about things. But when it comes to these types of shifts, my recommendation has always been give some time with your current decision before automatically thinking it's a mistake. Very poignant there. I would say Hunter's Moon probably considers Mark to be a suppressive person. You know, if we're following along some of those categories, I'm not going to reference the Church of Happyology any more than that because we don't want to get sued. But I would say that yes, there is definitely some comfort in some of the rituals, in some of the associated actions, even if you're not necessarily fond of the, the dogma and everything else. I think that there is a whole host of people who consider themselves non-religious, lapsed from a particular religion but still find occasional comfort if they have to go to church for a wedding or a funeral or something along those lines, that they still find some comfort in the going through the motions, so to speak. I wouldn't even say it's necessarily that they, they're fully believing in what it is that they're doing, but it's just 
we as human beings are creatures of habit. And so to the extent that those habits, even rooted in possible negative feelings or in some cases, even trauma, even if those habits are rooted in those very negative sensations, the habits themselves devoid and and divorced from that trauma and those horrible situations can still, in theory, be comforting. So I think that kind of speaks to your point that Moon Knight is going through the motions, even if he's not doing it because Kanchu wills it. Yeah, there's a book that I was given as a gift during my interviews for residency. I did not do my residency at this program, but the chairman for any uh, medical student that was interviewing, he gave his book, which I know is kind of his own self-promotion, but still, it was a really good book. It was called The Art of Serenity by T. Byram Karasu. The reason I'm bringing it up is because part of the poignant moments in that book is when he gives examples, obviously changing names because they were potential patients, but he gave the example when it came to religion and, and spirituality as a whole, not just religion, that it's okay to not have the exact same quote unquote level as everybody else. And he gave the example of a, of a uh, person of the Jewish faith that said, Herschel goes to synagogue because he is looking to find God. I go to synagogue to talk to Herschel, and I don't think I'm a worse man for it. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with taking bits and pieces of that. And I know I, I've said this in previous episodes, and, and especially since with, with the schooling we had, it's, the term was don't be a cafeteria Catholic. Well, this may be a really, really strange thing to say, and I hope we don't lose viewers because of this, but I have to be honest. Like, in parts of your life, it might be better to be a cafeteria person because it means that you really are conscious of your needs and you are meeting them the best way you can rather than trying to gorge at a buffet, taking absolutely everything without consideration for volume or quality. Yeah. I mean, at various points in my life, I was I was born again. I was a cafeteria Catholic, a C&E Catholic, whatever terminology you want to use. At this point in my life, I am a definitely a lapsed Catholic, agnostic, pretty much. So my personal views on religion and faith have changed drastically over the years. At the same time, I don't force my views on anybody. I don't, I don't want to go around and say to the friends of mine that are very uh, sincere in their faith and, and very much follow that faith to say to them, you know, I think you're, I think you you could spend your time in a better, I'm not one of those people. We all know those people. I'm definitely not one of them. So to Doc's point, you do what you need to for your own needs. And that kind of dovetails a little bit into the second point, which is struggling with empathy for those who would do him harm. And this is the idea that this is especially relevant for him in the in the current run where he's running the midnight mission. He's trying to do good for the community and he's trying to help people, even the ones who are not necessarily receptive always to the help that he wants to provide. And he's trying to understand where they're coming from because he doesn't want to be heavy handed and do this in the the sense that Kanshu had wanted him to, which is you're going to help these people no matter what and you're going to quote unquote make them see the light, sort of to call back to the religious discussion that we were just having, you know, proselytizing in an evangelical sense. He's much more of the at, at this point, I'm gonna do this. And if you want to come on board, great. If not, that's cool too. But I'm going to present this to you as a positive. And I hope you can join me on this journey. That is not an easy path to follow, especially given what he's doing and the less than safe neighborhood in which he's doing it and some of the things that he has to deal with. There's, there's a lot of a lot of ass kicking involved. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't envy anybody that has to put themselves in those situations or chooses to put themselves in those situations because not to date this episode, but there's current 
world turmoil between Russia and Ukraine. And I'm not about to get into my views on that. Stand with Ukraine. There's clearly a situation where if you have people that are being harmed in some way due to circumstances that are outside of your control, and other people may have views of you that are negative towards you, even though you've never met them. But for some reason, you know that you're going to have to have interactions or you know that there is something that's a part of what you do or, or how you live your life that this is not going to go away. Because let's be real, the simplest thing for anybody to do where there's conflict with someone else is to avoid the conflict, get away and, and just do something different. But that's not always realistic. And that's not always, uh, even if it is realistic, that's not always easy. Or you may actually want to fight that battle. No, not once again, getting literal with that. There's a certain level of resiliency you're going to have in your own mind, recognizing that the path that you are taking is going to automatically lead to, how do I put this? I don't want to say failure. It's not that it's going to fail. It's not that there's a 100% complete chance that, that nothing is going to work. It's that there are going to be bits and pieces that do not have the outcome that you wish to have. And... If you go in too idealistic, too optimistic, and don't consider the downside, then you're going to end up with way more emotional baggage than you first started with. Because your original thought, and I'm, I've heard this from many people, uh, not to put diagnoses on it, but for example, if someone is going through a, a bit of a manic or hypomanic phase, and they have the excess energy and therefore are looking to do a lot of good in the world, not even considering the idea that they may, one, unintentionally do harm, or two, simply be interacting with people that don't want their intervention, uh, they end up with responses that include anger, include depression, include lashing out, that they have a sense of priority, say, how dare you? I, I, I am looking to improve the world, and you're standing in my way. It, it, it's, it's fascinating to see when it happens. Uh, but that's an extreme example. If it's more or less you're going about your regular business and you're, let's say, volunteering for an organization, you're doing something that most people would consider to be good. But for whatever reason, there's a subsection of the people that you're interacting with that say, you know what? I've heard some bad things about you guys. And therefore, I'm going to make your lives living hell. I'm going to be a troll. I'm going to be a thorn in your side. And you're, you know, you're not going to like me. That's a really messy middle because it's not that the person dislikes you as the individual. They dislike for whatever reason, justified or not, just the premise of your existence. <laughs> it's, it, it almost becomes existential. So if that's the case, you're not arguing with that person. You are trying to reconstruct a philosophy. That is not something that the average schmuck, and yes, I include myself in that, in that description, that's not what we do on a daily basis. That's not how we live. And if you don't recognize that that's the battle you're fighting, then you're already lost. So this all comes back to regardless of the outcome, regardless of the results, what are you doing with that energy and that emotion after all that happens? Because as we've said so many times, you can look at it as a loss or you could look at it as a learning opportunity. You can look at it as a chance to just hide in shame or you can look at it as an opportunity to rebuild, an opportunity to look for the things that the other person gave you an opportunity to see that you never saw before. The fact that they recognized that you were important enough to have that reaction. And when you recognize your own importance in a situation, even if for whatever reason it resulted in negative emotions or, or, or a backlash or whatever, that still means that you can have an impact. You just want to make sure it's in a better situation next time. And that's the other thing. Hopefully there is a next time because so many people get the idea that because they tried something once and it didn't work, that that means it should never be tried again. I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, if it's something where it's a complete dead end, then okay, might need to move on. But if it's something that's simply going to be a long and arduous process, then 
sometimes you do have to pull those all nighters and go ahead and just get that episode out because, you know, everybody is requesting it on Wednesday morning. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It it was a joke, I swear. It it was a joke. Yeah, huh? <laughs> but no, I do think you made some really good points there. I've said, I don't know how many times in every situation you either win or you learn. And if you go into it with that mindset that there's no failure, it's just an opportunity for you to learn what doesn't work, then you're going to be much more adaptive. You're going to be much more adaptable and it's going to make the losses such as they are a lot easier to deal with. So I think for somebody like Mark, it's very important that, as you said, if he succeeds, great. If not, then he tries a different tactic and he figures out another way to do it. Or it could even be a situation where I don't want to say this too harshly, but he cuts his losses in the sense that he realizes that not every situation is going to end up as a total win and that some situations you're not going to get back what you put into it and you have to learn how to cut your losses and focus on the most productive use of your energy. And I think that's something that we collectively need to be better at, myself certainly included there. And I see Doc nodding his head, so I'm sure he knows all too well what it is that I'm talking about. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that a, a good portion of our listeners probably understand that too. So not going to get into that too much more. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, plug our sponsor, BetterHelp, and uh, some of our friends. When we get back, we'll get into treatment. Stay tuned. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp will assess your individual needs and match you with a licensed professional therapist. You can begin communicating within 48 hours. It isn't a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. BetterHelp has a network of over 15,000 counselors with a broad range of expertise. You can log in and message your counselor anytime to get timely and thoughtful responses. You can also schedule regular video or phone sessions. No waiting room required. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if you feel you don't have a good connection. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial help is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com slash capes, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer for Capes on the Couch fans. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash capes. Have you ever dreamt of being a superhero? Legends of Superhero Story is a new actual play podcast using the Legends Superhero role-playing game system, available on all podcast platforms. This exciting new superhero tabletop RPG follows our Game Master Jack and our fledgling heroes played by Chad, Emily, Amanda, and Daniel as they work their way through their origin story and beyond. Listen in as they discover their powers and abilities. Let's hope they learn to work together as a team in time to save the world and truly become Legends. Legends of Superhero Story is available on all podcast platforms. For more information, follow us on social media at The Legends Cast or visit our website, www.matchplaygames.ca forward slash The Legends Cast. Hi, I'm Erica Schultz, and this is Capes on the Couch, where comics get counseling. And we're back. So Treatment In-Universe, previously in episode four, Doc had suggested that he would attempt to exhaust the identities to break down Mark in not quite so many words, but just get to the root of it and see and get to the root of the trauma and try to address that with everything that we've learned over the past four years, both about ourselves and about DID and also about Moon Knight. What would your current take on in-universe treatment for Mark Spector be? Uh, keeping in mind, of course, which I forgot to mention, he is seeing a psychiatrist uh, in the current run. He's seeing Dr. Sturman, uh, Dr. Andrea Sturman, regularly. So he is undergoing therapy as part of his ongoing attempt to be the best version of Moon Knight that he can be. So after so many episodes and maturing, I realized I may have bit off more than I could chew with that type of idea. I have had some patients that even if they didn't 
fully qualify for a diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder. They certainly did have dissociative episodes. They certainly had significant trauma and stress reactions. And as I've learned more about that, as well as what we just talked about with Moon Knight's growth, I probably exhausted myself doing something like that. Now, I don't think it's proper for a counselor, therapist, psychiatrist, or or any other professional to look at the patient as someone treating them. That's, That's not what I'm getting at with what I'm about to say. Mark has to do some of the heavy lifting now because once you get to that point of discussing all of those things, there has to be a healthy cleanse on both sides to say we've we've really dug in deep and and there's been probably some tears shed and the therapist has probably had to do their own processing of all the information because it's not something that suffered alone and now what do we what do we do from here mark certainly has develop some tools that are helping him. And so my job actually is to step back and just do some fine tuning with the tools he already has, be that medication, be that specific forms of therapy, uh, especially if he has his own psychiatrist. I'm not trying to get in the way. I'm just trying to give more of a second opinion more than anything. Uh, and, And it's not something that has to be as intense as it was before. So basically, it's it's not even saying that what I did in the first place was not possible, but it's just to tone it down a little bit. Don't don't make it so that we feel like everything has to be completely broken down, but just acknowledging if you've come this far, let's not destroy everything that we've built by thinking we have to go that hard anymore. So what we started out with was a sprint, and now we're dealing with catching our breath and continuing the marathon. All right, that that's fair. Now, out of universe... We spoke at length about DID and trauma and things of that nature in the the previous episode. What changes would you suggest for the out-of-universe treatment based on everything that we've seen Mark go through? Perhaps, obviously, the powers notwithstanding, but walking away from the church, we'll say that we'll use that as the corollary and, and various other things. Yeah. So those types of significant adjustments, I would stand by what I said in the previous episode. I wouldn't change any of that. This is more of a in addition because they're very specific, much more practical pieces of information I can give about all of this. I'm actually going to recommend a book and this is just a general recommendation. It it isn't even necessarily for this particular thing. It's not a therapy or anything. The book is Atomic Habits by James Clear. I think it's one of the best books written about just making changes in your life that are going to be productive and healthy. Uh, The idea is we know fully well there are goals in our life that we want to do. In this case, I know it, it was much more dramatic in terms of stepping away from potential negatives for the sake of keeping the positives. Uh, But the point is you want to be a, You want parts of you to be different than what they are now. And how do you go about doing that? And the best description, just to summarize, and and the book does a much better job, okay? But just to summarize overall, you want to create a velvet rope and red carpet situation. And those are two separate things. But But because of how people usually envision it, it works. I'll explain. So if there is something that you want to create, that you want to do, you want to lay out the red carpet. How do you do that? You make it easy for yourself to do. Let's go with one of the most common things. Let's say that you've been indoctrinated so much by a particular religion, but there was a time you got so jaded, you stopped praying, but you know that that actually has been something that's really positive for you, very spiritual for you, and and you feel better about it. So you want to get back to doing that. Well, how do you do that? You know, regardless of what your religion is, but I'll, I'll use an example. Let's say you're you are used to a religion that says that you pray every morning. Okay, well, do you have to be in a certain spot? Is there a location? All right, in that case, make sure that if it's in your bedroom, make sure that you actually have your prayer mount laid out the night before. That way you don't even have to think about it. It's there. 
it's really simple for you to just go there. You don't even have to think about it. You know, did you have it in your calendar? Do you have it every morning when your alarm goes off and it says prayer time? Okay, I guess it's prayer time. You don't even think beyond that. You actually say, like, I'm glad that I'm a person that prays every morning. That's how you address people. Why would you do that? Because when you actually say things, when you actually say, this is my mindset, and this doesn't just work for religion. I know I'm using that as the example. If you want to work out every day, where is your workout clothes? Do you leave them right by the bed along with your shoes? It's really hard not to do it if you know it's right there. Do you tell yourself you're going to the gym and you say, you know what? I'm going to go to the gym and I'm just going to stand there for three minutes and I'm going to walk out. Because even if I didn't work out, I actually developed the idea that I'm going to go there. That sounds very silly. Why? Why does that sound silly? Because it means if you actually took the time to go to the gym, what do most people do? They're like, well, I'm here. I might as well work out. So there are just these little things that you can do to make it easier on yourself. Meanwhile, there's the other side. What if there are things that you really don't like? What if you don't like to go back to the religion point? What if you don't like the idea that because you have other things in your life, if you don't go and I'm, I sounds like I'm exaggerating. In certain cases, I'm not. I love the idea of going to church on Sundays, but I don't want to go to prayer service every single day for three hours. Well, OK, that's fine. Then what are you going to fill your time with otherwise? Once again, to use the calendar example, what's on your calendar? in those time periods, that'll make sure you're not thinking to yourself, oh my God, I am being the worst human being and I'm going to absolute hell because I am missing prayer service right now. You have to substitute. You have to make it difficult for yourself to not experience anguish over things that you've been completely indoctrinated with. And by the way, I'm not shaming anybody for if that's their pattern and it works for them. My point is if something is not working for you, recognizing that, Or to go once again back to the health part, if you're saying that I want to have a better diet, what are you doing to make it difficult on yourself to eat unhealthy foods? What have you replaced your the things in your refrigerator with? Because it's a guarantee you're going to eat things when you didn't expect to eat them. But it's a lot easier to say, wow, I'm really glad I picked up all those healthy snacks way ahead of time and I did my meal prep and made all my meals for the week so that there's fewer opportunities for me to randomly go to the snack machine. If you make it difficult by filling in those gaps, then you're not automatically going to do those things. I'm using these as practical points because we all make the excuse that this stuff has to be super complicated. It doesn't. The more we make something sound complicated, the more likely we are to ignore it. And that's the biggest issue with a lot of the things that we say are not possible. That's the reason why I'm not working out nearly as much as I should. That's right. I'm calling myself out. I recognize that we are not perfect. We are never going to be perfect. But the best thing you can do is taking small action now rather than waiting for the perfect opportunity for action later. That's the thing that I have noticed that has made my life better, that has made so many other people's lives better, rather than wondering, okay, how do I do this the perfect way? It's how do I do something that I can do right in the moment? Once you find those things, you'll notice over time that the rest of it is going to follow. To paraphrase Will Smith, take my name out your mouth. (laughs) Just put me on blast like that, why don't you? (laughs) I got a feeling that I just like really hammered a lot of people. And that's not the intention, but I'm going to be blunt. If this means that we have to make up a shirt that says, fuck doctor issues, I'm glad I'm doing this anyway. That (laughs) That's pretty cool. I don't care what it is. If that's the motivation, like, yeah, doctor issues is speaking the truth. I, I can do it. Or it's like, man, screw that guy. I am so going to prove him wrong and I'm still going to get everything done. All right. Awesome. It's a win-win for me, people. All right. That might be the next design up on RT Public. Sound off if you want to see a fuck Dr. Issues shirt available uh, in our store. Wait, wait, wait. You get, You know what? I think it should be on the front, fuck Dr. Issues on the back, but he was right.
<laughs> yes. Yes. I'm I'm loving that. I'm loving that idea. Okay, maybe Sound- maybe 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 tone it down just a little bit because we don't need, but I'm just saying that just that premise, yes. <laughs> I hate doctor issues, but he was right. How about that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let us know if you're interested in seeing something like that uh in our T public store and we can We'll work on design and uh, get that on some merch. Thank you. Thank you, people. Keep the compliments coming. Oh, wow. I haven't said that since high school. That was when I used to lean into that sort of thing. It's been a while since you've done a throwback reference like that. So speaking of throwbacks, let's uh, throw it back to Mark Spector and see what happens when we get him back on the couch. Hello again, Mark. Oh, bet you didn't think you'd see me again, huh? At this point, I don't try to predict the future. Open-mindedness has led me to a healthier headspace, so I don't see a reason to change now. I will say, however, that uh, I hope this session is less mm, dramatic. I think that makes two of us. Understand, though, it's not like that was entirely my fault. Too many chefs in the kitchen. It's tough to say that out loud. The good news is that I have a new perspective. I'm not trying to infringe on another professional's case. Uh, I've talked to Dr. Sturman. I'm impressed with how she's been able to help you so far. That's why I'm surprised she told me to see you. So uh, what gives? All of us take breaks when necessary, even psychiatrists. I mean, we can cover for each other. I, I mean, I get it conceptually, but if there's a problem, you don't swap out partners in a marriage, right? I mean, some people do, but most people don't. And why is that? Because unless you are really open, it tends to screw up the relationship you already had. Now, how am I supposed to recreate that kind of rapport with you? All fair points. Uh, I'm not replacing her. You know, I'm a second opinion, if that makes you feel better about it. Uh, 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 I consult. Well, considering this conversation is already smoother than the entire first session, I'll say it's a win for now. So what have you been working on most recently? It sounds like you've had like a consolidation. You know, that that's actually incredibly rare. As if you thought we're all separate anyway. I mean, I did some searching myself. You don't really buy all this, do you? Probably just tag me as crazy and throw my chart in a pile with schizophrenics. Please give me more credit than that. I'm, I, I'm not saying that. Your way of dealing with stress hasn't led to dissociation. I'm saying that the descriptions that have been given don't necessarily have to be their own person. Is this type of conversation going to actually help you? Or are you testing me? Mm, a little from column A, a little from column B. Are you satisfied with your reactions to potential situations that led you to split before? Well, I'll never be satisfied because I never want it to happen. I mean, it's not like we're a happy-go-lucky sewing circle, but there's mutual respect. How'd you get to that point? Why not arguing with the likes of you? <laughs> uh, but seriously, I had some baggage I had to drop. You ever had a mentor? Yeah, of course. No doctor's ever been trained without multiple mentors. I mean, even if we don't identify them that way in the moment, you know what I'm saying? Well, what if one of them leads you down a path you didn't want to go? What if they're responsible for your success, but then they're manipulating you, maybe even tearing you down? You get that? Yeah, I'm following you. Keep going. So what's the right answer? I mean, I know you enough that you're probably thinking, find your own path. Still, this guy has the path. Do things his way, and you are guaranteed some great results. Anything else kind of looks like failure. So you don't want to fail him or yourself? Well, the easy answer is both. But how... (sighs) Oh. This is, this is cliche. How does it make me feel? So you want my answer? Or? What? what? Uh, I get it. What are all of the answers? Well, Jake doesn't care as long as I keep the ones close to me safe. Steven thinks it's beneath us to pander to outdated nonsense, and I'm... I'm talking to you about it because I basically already made a decision for all of us and 
I don't want remorse over doing whatever the hell I want because I think I have all this under control. And I don't want a guilt trip from you telling me that this is what you wanted to talk about in the first session because I couldn't handle it directly and let the other guys take the lead too much. Plus, then there was all that hey, stuff. Hold, with on, my... hold, on, hold on, hold on. There's no need to get defensive. Okay, I'm, I'm thankful for your candor. I'll, I'll take what you're saying at face value, okay? Even if it's an ancient god that is partly responsible for the fact that I have this condition in the first place? All I'm saying is that whatever your descriptions are, relationships change. Some better, some worse. There's no point in placing blame. It sounds like you decided to move on. Well, I mean, that's not entirely accurate. I, I do still uh, do a lot under his auspices. I want to, just not his way. There's, there's bound to be some situations that piss him off. And I'm well past the point of caring. I mean, yes, he gave me these gifts. And yes, those gifts came with strings attached. But the hand operating the strings also became a ceiling. And if I wanted to grow, I was going to have to break the string, the ceiling, the hands, the whole damn thing. I guess the question is, is it worth it to you? You know, growth and destruction could look a lot alike. <laughs> Recognize that your own actions can create more trauma for yourself. Are you trying to get me riled up? I'm not going to throw away everything I built for some false sense of freedom. I'm willing to talk to you because I want to be smart about this. But let's be clear. My mind is made up. I don't need handholding. So you're not Conchu's lackey. Okay, but you're willing to wear the uniform, man. You, you maintain the moniker. Yet you, you have a long way to go before anybody looks at you any other way. I'll say this. I can tell I've matured. Because there's a part of me that would want to punch you in the face for that. And no, I don't mean it the way you're thinking. Okay, so what do you mean then? I mean, you have no idea what I struggle with on a regular basis. Hell, just even sitting in this chair talking to you is using up a lot of my mental faculties just to maintain a regular conversation. But I'm not the guy anymore who's going to use that as an excuse to lash out or or sit here and think that you're making assumptions about me. So I might as well live up to them. I, I'm trying to be a better man. God damn it. But these it just takes time and energy, you know, so I'm not going to work on reinventing the wheel. And just so I can say that it's mine, I'm going to do what I can with what I can and opinions be damned. Hmm. Don't be a reboot, be a remix. I like it. I like it. Um, I apologize uh, in hindsight for pushing buttons, but that's because I won't know exactly what clicks until you answer like that. I, I have enough trust in you that I can challenge your base assumptions and, and vice versa. So so where do we go with your plan? What, what, what's what's going to happen? Well, you may have trust in me, but all cards on the table, I'm still not fully on board with you. I mean, no offense, but I've been stabbed in the back too many times at this point to go head first into someone else's idea of what they think will help me be better. Even if they're letting me have one hand on the wheel. I've been there before and it was all a lie. So we can keep talking and maybe eventually we'll get there. But that's all I can promise you for right now. But I mean, from what I gather of you, though, I think that's enough for you to work with. All right. Can I level with you? Uh, when you first met me, you were all over the place. Your sentences bordered on senseless, and you continued to split so many times that it made my head spin. I, I knew that this was through no fault of your own, and I could have very easily considered you a danger. But I still want to work with you, and you know why? Because even with all of the altars, all the violence, all the chaos, I saw a man that was determined to find a way to do what he considers to be the right thing when he could have shunned the world for what, everything that's happened to him. Take that for what you will, but I think that means that we're about equal in terms of the contribution to the gap between our trust. Okay, I can work with that. So I guess we'll be seeing you around then, Doc. All right, well, that was uh, certainly went a lot smoother than the first go round. And yeah. I, would, I would say that this is probably the... 
episode we would have done had we not gotten to Moon Knight at this point. That's a fair assessment. I'm glad that it focuses on what's behind the altars rather than the altars themselves, because I feel like everything we were doing before was the entertainment pandering. And I don't I don't mean to say that because obviously that still was us. But well, I guess, you know what? I'm not sure we could have had this type of skit without the original skit, because I feel like it still wouldn't be addressing the point of him having the diagnosis of DID. So I'm, I, I feel like it's come full circle. Maybe we start off this way, but I think we still end up with maybe the original skit. Maybe it just flips around or something. I don't know. Yeah, in the beginning, when we were ad-libbing everything, it was definitely more focused on the entertainment factor than anything else. Uh, you know, eventually it reached the point where we were trying to key in on some actual advancement and development and character growth and if not a full-blown resolution, at least an understanding that there might be room for resolution in the future. So it's curious to see how Mark has changed over the four years, we've changed over the four years, and I would say we're all better off for it. Who knows what's going to happen in the future, and maybe we'll revisit Moon Knight again at some point. I don't know. I don't want to say yes or no, but anything is possible. So recommended reading. I believe I said last time I would recommend the Jeff Lemire run, or we weren't even doing recommended reading, I think, back then, but I would definitely recommend the Jeff Lemire run. Having said that, it's a little heady, and it's very much meant for longtime fans of the character because there are so many nods and references and things that you can appreciate so much more if you've read all of Moon Knight's history or at least large chunks of it. The current Jed McKay run is much more for folks that are getting into Moon Knight for the first time, and it's fantastic. It also has references to Moon Knight's prior history, but they're less, there's less of a continuity lockout, shall we say. Lemire's run is one of those things that you can read on its own, but it really only makes sense in light of the larger history. McKay's run is much more welcoming to new potential fans of the character. So like I said, they're on, I think, issue, I want to say it's issue 10 just dropped last week or two weeks ago. So go check that out. You can also, if you want to hear more about Moon Knight, you can watch the Disney Plus TV show and I've got a recurring guest spot on the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast as the in-house Moon Knight expert talking with Stargate Pioneer and Chris from Play Comics about, among among the other uh, co-hosts, about the television show and offering some outside experienced opinions and Easter eggs and things of that nature coming from the perspective of a fan versus everybody else on the panel who are much more new to the character and have limited understanding. Whereas I'm the guy going, oh, this actually references this issue of the comics and this character was referenced back then. And uh, I'm that guy. It's a fun way for me to be that guy um, in a limited and contained fashion, as opposed to me just being the guy like, have you heard about Moon Knight? Which is what I've been doing for the past 10 years. Now with the show, everybody's like, so what do you think about it? I'm like, well, uh, I had, I had a post on, on the website for the first episode and, uh, I skipped it for two. I'll probably get around to doing one for three and I'd like to keep it up, but I mean, it's just about the time, man. If I didn't have a job, my job is keeping me away from everything else that I need to get done in my life. I'm just saying. So next episodes, uh, Elsa Bloodstone, very, very fun character, uh, holding out for a hero. Uh, that's a, a theme episode is selected by Matt and to tie in with the uh, Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness, we are going to cover Wanda Maximoff, who was also suggested by our present level patron Ruby. So it's kind of a twofer. It's going to be the week after the movie comes out, though. Normally we do it like the Wednesday before, but we just frankly didn't have enough time to write a full episode for Wanda uh, to, to get it done in that time span. So we'll get there. But in any case, uh, as always, you can find all of our episodes on our website, capesinthecouch.com. 
as we said at the top of the show, that uh, we're still doing the reviews for good on Podchaser. So just a, again, a reminder, go to podchaser.com, sign up for free, leave us a review. We will respond and then money will get donated to the World Central Kitchen and help the Ukrainian refugees uh, are very much in need. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Capes on the Couch. And as we said at the top of the show, again, thank you to our brand new patron, Nicole. You can be cool like Nicole and get a shout out and a sticker and all, court, all sorts of other good stuff by going to patreon.com slash capes on the couch and subscribing at the one, three or $5 levels and unlock additional content, exclusive material, early access, uncensored stuff, all that good stuff like there. We're also going to have links in the show notes to all of that, as well as the two books that Doc mentioned during the episode. So uh, all that being said, Doc. Just a friendly reminder, make sure that the specter of your past doesn't loom too large, otherwise you'll miss your mark. And with that, we will head out. Thank you for Doc Issues. I'm Anthony Sitko. Thanks so much. We will see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.